Okay, right. Sam thought it was hilarious, by the way. She's just come back for lunch and she saw your car outside my car. <laughs> S- same colour. <laughs> Yeah, I used to be hashtag be like Kev, yeah, no, but it's no, right. now I'm not sure. Be like Neil. I don't know. <laughs> Bit of both, really. Yeah. The Kia twins. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't have another white car. Why not? It's like, I don't know. They just get very dirty. Well, oh. nice to have a sunroof again, though. Well, you have to have staff to clean them, like I do. The Fuji Cast. Right. Hello. Welcome to the Fuji Cast. Um, I was about to say week six. But you can't say that no, anymore. No, it's illegal. It's illegal. You can't Don't use... break the law. can't use episode numbers in your... Well, you can use them audibly, but just not visually. Oh, oh right. Within, okay. Within the, yeah, so you can welcome say... Welcome to episode six. Episode six. Welcome. This is a, a bit strange this week because we're kind of talking about stuff we're about to do rather than what we have done because we've got between us quite a full-on week of stuff. So we're not able to do a... Does that make sense? Mm, I'm already confused. What are you up to this coming weekend? Uh, so I've got... Because you're listening to this show, by the way, and the events he's just about to talk about, he's done. Yes, correct. So I went to watch Cardiff versus West Ham with my little boy. So let's do three en- uh, three exits for this one. Okay, great. How did Albie feel when they drew? Uh, he was a little bit disappointed, but it was great for him to see Cardiff. He's a big Cardiff fan. How did he feel when they won? Oh, he was so elated. It was amazing. Everybody was really happy. They haven't been winning many games recently. He was really upset when they lost wasn't he yeah, yeah poor little terrible. boy first game quite disappointing <laughs> West Ham did really well of course <laughs> there we yeah. go there's the three answers for that one there we go yep TPS coming up yeah photography show um, so so you, you would have done this would have done my talk how did your sh- how, how did your you know, I was going to say your show how did your talk go was, uh, it, was it well received it went very well did yeah, it very good I, I, was ner- I was very nervous yeah yeah um, I had a beer afterwards yeah <laughs> As usual. See, these are things that you can easily say because you know you'd have done these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, you don't get nervous when you're. In all seriousness, though, when you when you present your talks, now you don't get nervous. I do. You? do. I get nervous no when way. I wake up in the morning. No way. Just waking up in the morning. You've done so many of these. Oh uh, no, I get nervous. I get nervous when Why I shoot weddings. Nervous? I get nervous when I do talks. Uh, I get nervous when we do these things. No way. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah. I get nervous when I'm watching rugby. <laughs> You're a bag of nerves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So TPS. Um, yeah. So TPS. Uh, I shot. Uh, well, I I will be. So by the time you hear this, I will have shot a wedding. Good mm-hmm. to be back in the um, mm-hmm. in the saddle again. Um, and I was the the voice of God at a an, a, at a conference for do the it. football association. Do, it. do what you had to do. Um, I have, well, do what you do what you're going to have to have done when you. Well, did, no, it's all announcements. It's like welcome on stage, Phil Neville, and stuff like that. You have to drop your voice a bit. Albie loves the name Phil Foden. He Phil just, Foden? He, he, yeah, he plays for Man City. He just keeps wandering oh, yes, around the house course. going, Phil Foden. Phil, Phil Foden. Foden. Yeah. Welcome on stage, <laughs> Phil Foden. So, yeah, so um, busy, busy weeks ahead. And if you're listening to this, busy week just gone. So um, I thought we'd let's get that one done. This week is weddings week. Um, how you pitch, how you shoot, what you deliver. Uh, also, we have an interview with uh, Cameron Neville, just a bit uh, of an interview with Cameron Neville. If you're not sure who Cameron Neville is, he is um, a photographer based in Brisbane. Uh, but well, he was based in Sydney. He moved to Brisbane and he became a firefighter and he wanted to photograph those that, uh, that, that photographed the bushfires. I didn't know, by the way, 350,000 firefighters in Australia who fight these bushfires bushfires they're not paid it's a voluntary job really yeah you never know what you know wow. what's going to happen some of these these bushfires are ferocious yeah yeah, yeah, and, he, yeah. and he does talk about how he got cornered by one particular one he, and they don't give them breathing apparatus no um uh, so yeah they, these are amazing guys and girls who yeah. um who fight these fires um, so he is a photographer that's been making these stories about the bushfires. Mm-hmm. He's been featured on the BBC and various other press around the world. So there'll be a bit of um, a bit of an interview with him today. I'm, I'm playing you part of an interview, which is also on my Breathe Pictures podcast, which is where you'll hear the full interview because it's it's an hour. It's an hour long this mm-hmm. interview, mm-hmm. and that's it. So uh, and we've got our we've got questions as always. So should we kick off with the um, the questions first? Yeah, why not? So, uh, Phil. This is from Phil. 
Not Phil Neville. <laughs> Phil Foden. <laughs> Phil Foden, Phil Foden. Um, okay, so Phil says, I'm a long-time Sony mirrorless user and moved up to full frame last year, but over time I've become turned off by the extra bulk and weight of the body and lenses in that range. I've also started to try out a bit of street shooting and urban landscapes, but finding it hard to blend in with a bulky camera and very low shutter. I thought about just going back to the Sony crop sensor range, but I love the design ethos of Fujifilm, and I'm wondering if now would be a good time to make the switch. Primarily shoot landscapes, but also like a longer lens for wildlife. Mm. I'm finding it a bit difficult to get my head around the different naming conventions and wondered if you can help with a bit of guidance on how the range breaks down. Okay. okay. This is very much you. <clears throat> yeah, and it's actually really quite interesting because as much as I you know, I, I love the Fujifilm cameras and everything, I do find the naming conventions confusing and strange. Mm. Um, especially like the XF10. When the XF10 came out recently, to me that would that's the same naming convention as uh, as the lenses, but that was a camera. So anyway, that's the marketing people are far more intelligent than me in that respect. But the uh, the simple way to try and think about this is you have the two <laughs> It's not simple. That's the fact. It's not simple. In fact, there are there's kind of you have your GFXs. I'm I'm not going to include the GFX. Okay, that's that's a different ball game completely. So at the top of the tree, if you like, you have the XH, you have the XT, and you have the X Pro. Um, the X Pro probably was well named when they first decided to call it the X Pro. Perhaps not the wisest name now because that implies that it's more professional than the xt and the xh when in fact it's not um so those three kind of sit at the top of the tree um the x pro and the xt are effectively the same cameras um although currently you have the the difference between the xt3 and the x pro 2 in terms of sensor generation um but they are the guy that you know the uh, essentially those cameras are effectively going to be the same or they are the same and you 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 pick your camera based on the ergonomics the uh the, the look and feel of the camera whether you uh, prefer a rangefinder style camera etc then under that you have uh little kind of mini xts if you like which the which is the xt30 that's just been released which is essentially the same as the xt3 but with um a few little bells and whistles missing um cheaper less weather sealed all that kind of stuff then on the x pro range uh you have the xe cameras which are kind of the cut down versions of the x pro to a certain extent um now i love the xe range actually the xe3 is a fantastic camera good 4k video uh, all of that stuff in it um and then below that you have a whole load of other things xt100 x100 xa45 whatever it's on now um x uh, XF10, uh, I think there was an XQ, um, X70 that no longer sells, uh, X30s they had. Um, but in terms of you answering your question, Phil, really, uh, you know, when it comes to the high level stuff, X Pro, XT, XH, it you really you just want to be basing that decision, I think, on uh, the look and feel, the weight, uh, you know, whether you need in body image stabilization, which I don't think you do, judging by it. Um, and then, you know, look at the cheaper models as well. They're just as good. They're just as good. Philando Jones. What a great name. Philando Jones. Philando Jones. By the way, do tell us where you're... Where, where your email, what, what, what accent was that? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> um, where you're emailing from, because it's really interesting, and because these aren't necessarily British or wherever. I mean, the Canadian, America, mm. wherever. I'd be fascinated to know where you're, where you're emailing us from. It's always nice to know. Um, hi, you two. I was wondering if you would discuss effective storytelling for photography and video. I'm solely doing stills at the moment, but I've been considering jumping into video. Uh, where is a, a good start? I'm, I'm not quite sure what stories you're uh, you're intending to make but um why don't we start with storytelling for photography how, how do you approach when you when you're shooting a wedding and um, this week is is, is going to be about weddings so we're coming on to that soon but when you when you get a photograph of a wedding how do you approach the because you're a storytelling approach you have a storytelling approach uh-huh. what do you do well for me i always think that a story much like 
uh, anything in a book or a newspaper article must have a start, a finish, and an end. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at establishing shots. We're looking at venue shots, detail shots, linking shots, shots that connect one part of the story to the other. So it could be simply a corridor. It could be simply the street sign of the uh, of the address that the parents' house is in. Uh, all of that kind of stuff as, mm -hmm. as establishing shots. Then the middle is the effectively the, the core of the day. Um, and then you're ending shots. Often people will will end, you know, probably correctly with a, a, a nighttime venue shot. Um, I typically don't do that, but you know, it's it's something that I think you've done in the past. And yeah, if I'm walking away from a venue and I can see an obvious shot, I will. Yeah. If, I, if I don't see an obvious shot, yeah. it's no point trying to shoehorn something no. in for the sake of it no quite right and uh yeah i mean y you know that's it for me in terms of y you know the, the, the start mm. and middle and end and to help me with with figuring out if i've told the story because it's you know documentary wedding photography is the, 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 there are different within that kind of remit uh, there are different ways that people do things e all equally as good as each other there's no there's no kind of right or wrong way um but sometimes i find myself thinking Am I just doing headshots? Am I am I telling a story, yeah. or am I just taking pictures for the sake of it? And they're just candid headshots. Okay. But that's when working wide or close, and you need to think right. Okay, this is turning into a headshot series. I need Correct. to widen out on this. Scene. Yes, and so on the inside of my camera bag, I have the five. I have five W's written down. Okay, and the five W's stand for who, why, what, where, and when. So I can look at those five W's and remind myself right have i told the story of who's here have i told the story of why they're here have i told the story of what they're here for when and uh, things like the weather all of that kind of stuff who by the way with the weather can you hear that can you hear that noise in the background you you'll yeah Is that that, rain? that's the rain uh -huh. this studio is really well soundproofed and stuff but it's not very good from above hello <laughs> so that's the that's the weather so weather yeah, no. <laughs> Weather is not one of the Ws. Oh, sorry. I'm who, why, what, who, where, why, and what, when. Who, why, what, when, when, yes. Yeah, who, why, what. Classic photojournalist questions. Who, why, what, where, and when. Start, middle, and end. Yeah. Can't go wrong. Okay. Although I've gone wrong many times. I sometimes write down, I've got little things that I, I've, um, on my plan, I take an A4 sheet of planner with me, which is, uh, which gives me um, timings, you know, when things are starting, some basics like that, some names of parents, um, and uh, and then some little cues for things. Because during a wedding, sometimes you do get a bit lost, and you think, "Oh, what what, do you know? what, what can I do now?" And I, I put down little things like find the oldest person, or and stuff like that, which is just little <laughs> find cues. The oldest find the person. oldest person. Oh, I, you know. How do you know though? I, well, you don't. Well, you look around, you look for the cracks. <laughs> don't you? <laughs> We've got a story about actually finding the oldest person oh. in the in the wedding bit coming up, but that's not. There's not. I'm, I'm perhaps use the, the the worst one I can, but I do have little cues, little notes, things. That, go look for this. Go look for that. Which sometimes in in the middle of a day you need things like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're dead right. I I always say this when I'm talking about street photography. Careful it's, about using the word dead. dead. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the that's the clue to what's coming up. Yeah, um, I always say when I'm doing the street photography stuff that unless I've got something to look for, yeah. then and then I struggle. Mm. Um, and and I do very similar things at weddings, but I don't have uh, I don't particularly write things down. What I might do is if you know what during the drink reception when or you know that that piece of dead time between the speeches and the first dance when yeah. often people are just drinking cups of tea and yeah, yeah. nothing appears to be happening. Yeah. And as wedding photographers, often we think we should be taking pictures because. You know they're paying us. We, mm. We're the photographer. We should be walking around with the camera to our eyes. And actually, I don't. I don't subscribe to that. I, you know, I think that we are. Anybody can take a photo, but they are employing us as the the observers, the recorders, yeah, right? Absolutely. So, um, not necessarily always taking pictures, listening, watching, waiting. That's part of the job as well. But it does help me if I, for example, think right, uh, human interaction. Uh, you know, during that time when things are not happening, or people with glasses on, or you know, people holding hands, whatever that kind of stuff. I've yet to think of the oldest person. Find the oldest person. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. So from a storytelling point of view, those things help definitely. And actually, you can also work in things like diptychs and triptychs and things like that, where if you see something, you think, right, how can I build a story about this object or this mm-hmm. person or this scenario in three images that link themselves together? Totally. I find a lot of photographers work in in, the, in that method. That's yeah. a really good way of, yeah. of doing it as well. Yeah. I mean, with with regard filming um, video, because you're saying you want to you want to jump into video. Um, it would have been good to know whether you want to, uh, uh, what kind of video you want to do, whether you're talking about, whether you're coming from a wedding scenario and you want to turn your stills into also shooting for, for weddings or whether you want to do biographical pieces, interview pieces. Don't know, that's not clear here. But making stories for video, then, yeah, you need to start thinking, you, you, you need to storyboard in your mind a bit. Because um, I don't, I don't write long, convoluted storyboards out. I've mm-hmm. never made films in that way. Um, perhaps that's a bad thing. Uh, some people say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good method in, in in terms of the way I shoot, which is often in a photojournalist kind of way. I'd, I don't want to storyboard it because then your eyes and ears aren't open to what could be happening in mm-hmm. front of you. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't. When you make your films, mm. you 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 don't storyboard either, do you? No, really. No, I don't. But. I do often look at react films. reactionary. Yeah, you know, I, I I find it very difficult to change mindset from documentary photography to filmmaking because you know, even when you're doing a perceived documentary film, mm. there's still a lot of planning, a lot of staging, a lot of setting equipment up, lights, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Whereas my my mentality is, you know, everything as it happens and so i i really struggle with that kind of thing um well i know people will film like that as well and you know it, it, it works out really well but that's that's my challenge you know so when i'm thinking about even if i'm thinking about going to film in london for the day um you know i'm like right i'm just going to take the camera and film and then i realize that i can't i need to think about sections and i need to think about continuation and uh, you know, linking the, the continuity. Scene, yeah. Continuity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I just have to think about how to say that word sometimes. Yeah. Like, Sorry, what I, it I, means. It sounded like I was being a school teacher. <laughs> um, but y- you know what I mean. It's not. It's not the same as just shooting stills. Well, in in video world, of course, you've got the word pickups. Now, pickups are often used to then um, continue to, to well that continuity to explain a story after you've shot it. You think, right, okay, well, I've got this story. I need to grab a load of pickups, which aren't necessarily the same as B roll. Pickups are where you think, right, I've told this story, but that doesn't make sense at the moment unless I film this to provide this conduit, this kind of the the, the way to carry the story from A to B. So. For example, um, a couple of weeks ago in the Gambia, I was filming a whole load of pickups, um, which helped the story glue together right. for the film um, that I'm still yet to release on YouTube um, about um, about gathering the story that I was making in the Gambia. I recorded my pickups were all of me being in the bed in the morning. Don't worry, you're not going to see me naked in bed. <laughs> um, but uh, the first thing I would do is I, I would reach to the camera as if it was the first thing that I was finding in the dark and I'd do a, pe- a diary piece to the camera saying oh well we didn't manage to get the interview today I'm hoping we'll get it tomorrow they were all recorded afterwards knowing what the res- knowing what the result was in the end I recorded right. the pickups after to yeah. glue the story together now I'm sorry if that no 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 spoils but that, the- <laughs> of course that's that you know uh, that when it comes to films then it cannot be any other way. Re- well, I mean, I'm sure it can be, but if you've got the time and luxury to do it, then yeah. it makes more sense. I always laugh at on YouTube when I see people getting into cars on the <laughs> vlogs. That just makes me howl because, uh, you know, it's like they film themselves walking to the car and then they film themselves getting in the car, getting in the car from got, the inside. Then you got one from the inside. That's it. Yeah, uh, and I'm like, it. Everybody knows you've just gone and stuck your camera inside there, stuck yeah, it to the dashboard yeah. with one of those sucky things. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody knows that the first three times you tried it, you shut the door, the camera fell off the sucky thing, and yeah. you know you've had to redo it and stuff. And and it just makes me help. I've done it myself. Honestly, I'm not knocking people for doing it. I've done it myself. It's called pickups. But yeah, I suppose it is. Or B-roll. But it it just uh, I, honestly, it's specifically the getting in the car thing that makes me laugh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, there's a there's a few suggestions for you for you there. Da- David Park in Melbourne, Australia. See, that's what I like. Tell yeah. us where you are. We should put that on the website. Maybe. Yes. Do you have any tips, please? Do's and don'ts and settings on. I'm being a bit of a 
a bit of a what's it with this one because I'm looking at Kevin. I know he's going to smile when I say any do's and don'ts and settings on using the in-camera flash of the X100F. Ooh. Okay. So um, the in-camera flash on the X100F is amazing. Uh, I have used it. I've used it a few times. um, And every time I used it, I had Bert Stefani with me, (laughs) who is a Belgian ex-photographer, and he basically told me what to do and what (laughs) settings to use. Uh, Something to do with second curtain sync, slow shutter speed, uh, various other things. So to answer your question, the the flash on the X100F, this is Basically, if you're not using it on very simple TTL automatic, in which case it will just work, uh, you want to do anything creative with it, uh, speak to Bert. Go to Bert's website. <laughs> you Bert's, have to have Bert with you. BertStefani.com. Yeah. Yeah. You want to hire Bert for the day? Yeah, bring Bert. be with you. Big Bert. That's the way that it works. Mm-hmm. Any questions? Uh, yeah. So, uh, Steve Brill. Actually, this wasn't a question so much. It was more of an observation. Mm. I find your early segment about wedding photographers' age interesting. Being of an age where I'm finding I usually, or being of an age where I am finding I am usually a similar age to the bride's parents, mm. it's always concerned me. Mm. So glad to hear your views. Um, yeah. Mm. So that was it, really. And that's one of the things we picked up on, wasn't it? Yeah. When we both started, mm. we were the age of the people getting married. Yeah. And now we're more of the age of the parents. Um, well, I started later, so I was never really of the age of being the young bride and groom's age. No, but I pe- was always parent. Well, always approaching parents' age. You reckon? I. I mean, I don't. I rarely photograph like twenty-one, twenty-two year olds. They're all. Well, no, I still do a few. Really? Yeah. Not many. Yeah. Not many. I tend to have clients now, are definitely thirty and forty plus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that was more of an observation, and yeah, I, uh, and I think well, we don't want to re- recover that ground, but I think we both agreed that age isn't really something a bride and groom would look at when they're choosing their photographer. At least we hope not. So this week is all about weddings, and we're going to come to that in a moment. Um, first of all, let's uh, let's play this week's uh, interview to you. This was recorded um, a couple of weeks ago, and um, and sadly, I had to record this on Skype. I went ten and a half thousand miles to Australia, <laughs> and I did do that photo walk with Marcus Anderson. But uh, the 450 miles to get to Brisbane from Sydney, for some odd reason, just seemed like a trip too far. <laughs> Probably because I think Sam and the boys would have disowned me mm. if we would have flown all that way mm. for what was essentially a holiday. Yeah. And, and then I'd have gone off and started recording lots of podcasts and films and stuff. But um, Cam is an extraordinary individual who um, owned a studio in Sydney. He moved to Sydney in his early 20s. Loved the place, fell in love with Australia, and Australians stayed. Um, he moved out of Sydney, went to Brisbane, uh, which is near the Gold Coast, or Gold Coast. Do you call it the or gold? Anyway, and um, he ended up fighting fires and um, became a photojournalist for the people that fight those fires. So the the full-length interview is on, on the Breathe Pictures podcast, but I thought it'd be fascinating to spend a few minutes in, with, with, with Cam Neville here because it's slightly different to what we're going to be talking about in a moment, weddings. Um, lighting the, the touch paper, really, of, of photojournalism and, and fighting bushfires down under. The fire rating danger for parts of central Queensland has now been raised to the highest level in the state's history. We have got some unconfirmed reports uh, of homes being lost. You were warned to brace for catastrophic fire conditions and tonight property has been destroyed with blazes burning out of control. The catastrophic danger area is enormous, covering a large swathe of the state. Uh, it's, it's actually... A- the point where it's got its own own pyroconvective column which is resulting in some extraordinary instability around the fire on today's show i'd like to introduce you to a special breed of photojournalist though he'd be brisk to point out he's no hero that those he photographs and the conditions he makes photographs in is what should draw you to his work Australian photographer Cameron Neville has been making news of late for the very real and stark pictures he presents of those in the front line fighting the continent's ferocious bushfires. Once a city dweller with a studio in a fashionable part of Sydney, life took a series of unexpected twists and turns for Cam, which resulted in a move up coast and a project that was about to consume his life both professionally and personally. Cam Neville makes pictures of those who fight fires, the unexpected, twisting, cruel, heartless, ruthless bushfires that rip through whole communities across Australia. 
But his work doesn't stop at recording the devastation to property, the bush, the people, the wildlife. He fights the fires too. Monday the 14th of January, 7.29. Fire call. Fire in bushland behind 53 Felling Drive, Oxenford. Just out of bed, still in my boxer shorts, and my phone was going off. I was due to take the children to school, but all of a sudden I got a fear of dread that we were dealing with a monster fire. Little did I know that six hours later we would have spent the whole day at a house on top of a ridge protecting it from the fire, a grass, fast-moving grass fire that was spreading very quickly across into neighbouring properties. My friend Keith and I had run out of water. The trees had come down across the driveway and we were stuck. There was no way out. The fire had surrounded the house on three sides. It was a long day and then we, we were stuck in smoke and we had no water and we literally were fighting the fire with our boots, a rake, and one lowly fire extinguisher. In 2018, I got to visit Australia in the summer, the country's winter. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Australia. Well, the local time in Sydney is 6.41 a.m. on Thursday, the 26th of July. But despite flying 10 and a half thousand miles around the world, the 450 miles between Sydney and Brisbane seemed oddly a trip too far. At that time, I'd only spoken briefly with Cam via social media channels and was hoping to walk the charred lands he fights and photographs. But that diversion evaded me, and on my return to London, I read more about him and his incredible powerful photographic stories called Into the Fire at 35,000 feet somewhere over the Middle East. So it was via Skype that I finally managed to interview Cam about his work in what I can only describe as a conversation that felt a little like the subject he photographs. I went into this with one plan, but that chat spread unexpectedly, taking on a far more personal story at times than simply the photographic angle. And even though Skype managed to do what an Airbus A380 couldn't, I was thwarted on a couple of occasions from even starting this conversation, since Cam being on call for what they term the bushfire season seemed always to be on active duty standby. He was even nervous to start this recording you're about to hear since a large crew was being assembled to fight a fire on the New South Wales and Queensland border. But this is just another day in the life of a firefighting photographer, it seems. I think this year, 2019, um, certainly in Queensland, has been, uh, I believe they're saying now that it's been our biggest bushfire season oh. in history. Um, so we've had a monumental sort of seven months of uh, continuous fires, um, which is unusual because our fire season is generally only supposed to last three months. So it's gone almost uh, twice over that already. So It's a bizarre um, thinking of it as being a fire season. You know, certainly in Australia, it's a, it's a very real part of, of life, particularly, you know, where I live uh, here in southeast Queensland. The, the fire threat is very real. Um, a lot of us play it down, but uh, sometimes... Um, you know, it is serious. I mean, we've had a number of very, very serious fires, um, you know, within five to six kilometres of my house in the last sort of four months. So, um, you know, I didn't, um, you know, in actual fact, you know, starting this project I only really started, um, you know, six years ago um, when I came up to Queensland. I mean, I, we had the Black Saturday fires in 2009, which were devastating. You know, it was 173 people were killed. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was uh, Australia's worst ever bushfire disaster. I mean, it was uh, absolutely terrible. I'm fascinated primarily today about the inter into, uh, although having now chatted with you there's so many other projects of yours we could talk about but today it's into the fire this this photojournalist project to document the firefighters who, who fight wild bushfires well, you became a volunteer firefighter some six years ago in in order to make this series i had no idea that the guys that attend these fires are, are local volunteer forces yeah yeah absolutely the vast majority of firefighters in Australia, which I think number somewhere around 350,000, are all volunteers. So did you did you go in with the express intention to make pictures and document or to fight fire, or was it a real mixture? Honestly, I have to be honest, I'm not sure I knew what I was doing at the time. It just sort of uh, it, it became a bit organic. I... I uh, I had an idea that it would be interesting to see, and and to be honest, um, 
I don't I wasn't sure they were actually going to let me take a camera you know behind the behind the scenes so to speak you know it was a real punt in the dark how did the firefighters view your presence then with the camera at, f- at first were they were they a bit reticent not at all they uh, I mean you know literally from the get-go uh, they were really really open to it you know and I was thinking back to you know when McCullen spent time during the Tet offensive in Vietnam you know the marine captain who is interviewed in the that film made by Jackie Morris uh, on McCullen. He, he talks about how McCullen, you know, the other media came and stayed for one or two days and left, and, and McCullen stayed for two weeks mm. and rescued people from uh, from being shot and all these things. And and look, like I can't compare myself to Tom McCullen, obviously. For me, there was a you know a big trust thing going on, and I I just felt like I had to give something back. Yeah, that that uh, did, you know that that occurred to me. Are you the firefighter with a camera, or the man who fights fires now who just happens to carry a camera? That's a really good question. And uh, for me, the lines are a bit blurred sometimes between. Uh, I mean, you know, certainly of late in 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 2018-19, I've I, I don't think I've shot as many pictures purely because of the, you know, the operational tempo we've been under. Um, you know, we, we've We've had a lot of fires. We've we've got guys that have got fatigue and things like that. So I mean, uh, I think uh, certainly in this last six to eight months, it's it's been quite the res- the reverse. What are the equipment issues when it's when it's this intense, this this hot? Yeah, well that that's it, the heat. I mean, I, I had to develop a kind of style where I'd, I'd literally whip the camera out and try and focus and take the shot, and then it'd have to go back inside my fire suit or behind my glove. Um, you know, quite often hold the camera up and I'd have the glove sort of half in front of the lens trying to focus to try and keep some of the heat away from the camera. And, um, I, you know, I've been a touch lucky. I think I even dropped um, – I was actually on the edge of a uh, – we were burning a ridge line and I, I had taken a rather risky <laughs> – position it was the only time i actually had didn't have the camera around my neck and as i stepped around a pole i, I dropped the whole thing in in that burning ash of the fire mm. lens first what do you have to do with the pictures what what are you doing with them i mean there's such huge degrees literally of, of difference between light shade fire yeah so look uh, i mean i, I think I'm, I'm just really conscious of not oversaturating the colors too much um i try to keep the scene as I saw it, I mean, there is, because a lot of these are shot at night, it's very tricky because I'm trying to pick up shadows, highlights, and of course, obviously, with the fire itself, I mean, I want I want detail in the flames, and that quite often means that I have to, you know, underexpose quite a lot, and then I have to try and pull the shadows out if I can, um, you know, in post-processing, so... Um, there is um, – it can be tricky. It doesn't always work. And, and for me, if um, if it looks over the top, it generally is, and therefore and then I don't use it. Um, I mean, I, I have got to the point now where I have – you know, if I'm shooting at night, I have the camera on particular settings and it, it seems to work. The fire has split Inferno as it rages through Forestdale. Flames At the moment, there are still a number of road closures in – these are the latest pictures showing... If you would like to hear more from this fascinating insight into Cameron Neville's life as a photographer, a photojournalist and a firefighter, then um, go listen to the Breathe Pictures podcast of Cam Neville and uh, you can hear the full one-hour podcast on that. Fascinating guy, though, isn't he, Kev? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, I'd, I'd never really been seen his work before, but mm. you introduced me to it, and yeah, absolutely amazing. Next week on the show, by the way, um, I think it'll be next week. I might I might well be sort of pushing myself to do this by saying this. Um, I want to uh, feature Jason Florio, who has a fascinating 10 minutes on the day that he came face-to-face with a tower collapsing on him at 9-11. 9-11. So yeah. um, that'll be a powerful one. Yeah, and those images are, are yeah. just mind-blowing. Amazing. Right. Um, we're doing weddings this week. Before we get to um, the weddings, um, there was something that came in that I, I thought was quite interesting from a, from a peer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Ian Ian Bursell, who actually is a, another wedding photojournalist style photographer, great, really good photographer. One of the people that when I first came into the industry, I was kind of fell in love with his work and and you know used to kind of pour over it a lot. I'm not sure I've actually ever met him, but Piers 
appears to be a very nice guy anyway great photography so the question was um neil mentioned in episode one that he's shooting fewer weddings each year for around the last three or four years do you think that the in inverted comments uh rock star household names in the industry have made a bit of a rod for their backs by training up newer photographers in workshops I know it's a lucrative thing to do and brings in extra income, but I've always thought that it was akin to training up your future competition. It's like the graphic design industry when desktop publishing software and Apple Macs were launched. Loads of people overnight became graphic designers without any prior training. Seems the same is happening in the wedding photography do- wedding photography industry, but we're going one step further and actively training our training competition. Up, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, good question. What do you think? Well, um, first, there's a couple of points on this, I think. First of all, that, that whole kind of rock star household name thing, that that just doesn't exist in my, my head. You know, if you took Jerry Gahonis, um, you know, or you took Sanjay Jogia or whoever the, the perceived household names are in the wedding photography industry and stuck them in Costa Coffee in the middle of London, Nobody would know who they were. No. Nobody would recognise them no. or anything. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I take the point Ian's making about kind of probably known in the industry. Um, but they're probably known in the industry for a reason, a, you know, a very good reason. Um, so I just hate that term, rock star household names. But th- but there you go. And But the point about When the you see these people, the way they act, some, I'm not talking about Sanjay <laughs> or, or Jerry. No. Uh, can I just quickly say that? But when you see how some of the so-called well, to use Ian's phrase, mm-hmm. rock star mm-hmm. photographers operate. Um, you, you think that that's the way people do feel about themselves. I've seen them at conferences. Some you, of them. You've seen them at conferences. Yeah, very few, though, in fairness. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. I mean, uh, and perhaps Ian is right to use that term rock star, maybe perceived rock star. Self-titled in, thing, really. Self-titled yeah. rock star, yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. There are some people who, you know, who kind of float above their own level, I guess, in, in terms of that. But I honestly think the people who are giving workshops and are doing training and education, mentoring, etc., and are continually doing it, i.e. people are continually mm. booking them mm. and coming on the workshops, are obviously doing a good thing. And it's not just a case of making money. It's a case of education. You know, anybody can be, if you're a very good photographer, it does not mean you're a good educator, mm. for sure. Uh, I run lots and lots of street photography workshops. I don't consider myself to be a particularly good street photographer, to be honest with you. Um, certainly not, you know, of, of any kind of uh, income generating level in terms of selling my street photography. Mm-hmm. But people tell me that I'm a, a good educator. And so that's really what I'm doing. I'm kind of helping people in that respect now when it comes to weddings uh, this whole idea of uh you know teaching the uh opposition or teaching the uh the, the competition again i don't think that's really true because y- if you're a good educator you will be teaching them to respect the industry be good in the industry help the industry rather than simply teaching them how to you know shoot weddings that are just going to be taken from underneath your 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 kind of foot mm-hmm. so i consider us all as little tiny cogs in this this big circle you know and all of the little cogs turning in the right direction will help the big cog go in the right direction now that comes down to education it comes down to understanding i mean if you you know if doctors didn't teach other doctors what to do you know if teachers didn't teach if Mm. if, if photographers didn't show other photographers how to do it mentor and you know educate ethically and correctly then you know we would be in a sorry state simple as that and you know at the end of the day there is money in it and it would be i would be completely wrong to say that i don't make reasonable part of my income from doing workshops but i have two choices really i can sit on my butt at home and complain and whinge that you know there's there's less weddings coming in or i can get off my butt and do something about it you know i can do workshops i can do podcasts i can do youtube videos i've written a book mm-hmm. uh you know uh, it, the choice is there you know when, when are you qualified to to do these workshops i remember um a workshop that we've both been on where the uh, uh, where the person taking the course, I'm not, not going to mention names, yeah. um, had suggested that it was a travesty that people who had only been shooting for a year were, were able to get up and, and talk about an industry that they frankly didn't have any real experience of. Yeah, well, uh, I, and I kind of agree with him, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I my personal level was five years, so I, I set myself... 
uh, a kind of time frame of five years before I would do a workshop. And my the people that used to come to me for workshops were for SEO, so the business of, of workshop, the business of weddings, mm. SEO marketing, mm. online marketing. Uh, and I had a very deep background in that from my previous career. So I waited five whole years before I started doing those, um, and then another couple of years before I started doing the, the photography tile workshops. But in all cases, it was because people were asking me to do those things. And it would be stupid for me not to try and do something with it. But very ethically, that's the point. You have to do it with a, you know, with a good mind, good conscience. You can't just be doing it for the running and taking the money, which is where that one year question kind Mm. of comes in. So there are a lot of people who believe their own hype and... I'm probably cutting things a little bit fine to the bone here, but you you see it on Facebook and they they write things like, I've been asked so many times to run a workshop about blah, 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 blah. I'm considering doing it. What do you think, folks? And and then there's no replies, right? And And that's because, A, they haven't actually been asked to do workshops, probably. They just think that they're good enough to do it. And they, you know, they have this this kind of uh, self-belief. Well, the, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but that's where the... Uh, uh, I'm going to come back to it. Yeah. I'll let you finish your train of thought. But the ethics thing with the SEO, I'm going to come back to it. Well, no, absolutely. It's it's an ethical thing. And, you you know, you I always believe that if you're doing workshops mm. and you're, uh, you're teaching photography or writing or reading or anything... The whole point is to educate, Mm. okay? There's a difference between education and training. Education is for people to come away with an understanding of how to do things the right way, not how to do things the cheap way, not how to do things the wrong way, not how to, uh, you know, annoy the opposition, not how to undercut people, you know, do things the right way. The difference is education, the word education, Mm. simple as that. Um, so I've always yeah. the ethics thing is interesting, but I've watched you um, present many times on SEO, digital marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, yet not once have I ever thought mm, that's interesting. I'll just take this wholesale and go and make my own course out of it. Mm. Is that what you mean by ethics? Partly, or, or there can are some people who people. are then good at educating from your notes? Is that cool to go then regurgitate your course? No, I think that I th- you know. L- listen, the fact is that if you give content out, you 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 can only expect people to to take that and and do other things with it. Ethically is a good thing. <laughs> However, there are and I've been you know I, I've had people come on my workshops. Uh, you know, I've had one guy come like three or four times to different various workshops, and then suddenly he's doing a workshop of his own with pretty much exactly the same content. Uh, you know, and, and and that is not good because that's that's just educating other people with somebody else's mm. education. Mm. If that makes sense. Mm. Um, but saying that, of course, you know, uh, my knowledge of SEO, my knowledge of photography came from different workshops different things i'd seen online and you know whatever and so you build your own um kind of content if you like but it has to be a personal thing it has to be about you wanting to you know to to help people to move people forward rather than just being about the money it's not just about the money if it was just about the money then you know you 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 would never shoot a wedding again you would just you know maybe that's what ian's talking about Perhaps. I mean, yeah. the, the honest fact of it is that I, you know, I could probably do a, a street photography workshop twice a week, yeah. every yeah, yeah. every week of the year. Uh, you know, I have so much, so many people asking me about that. Um, but I don't because A, I want to enjoy it. B, I want to give the people as much um, time as possible on those workshops. And C, I, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a photographer. Mm. I, want, I want to make my money from making from shooting pictures rather than just doing the education. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was a really good question by Ian, and, and you know, it's it's uh, it's a perception thing. There's there's a bit of irony now because we're going to um, we're gonna we're gonna launch something here this week. I let Kev do the details on it, then I've got a question to go with it. It's competition time. Okay, so here's, here's here's the irony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we actually we we actually only thought about this. We were ta- we were discussing Ian's question earlier, um, and you know we thought actually why don't we do something? So this isn't a kind of pre-planned thing. So what we thought was. Um, in terms of kind of training, mentoring and education and all that kind of stuff, it'd be really cool for one of the listeners to come and spend a couple of hours with Neil and I, me and Neil, Neil, Neil and, and I, I. Yeah, Neil yeah, and I. Yeah, yeah. 
um, in, uh, great, in the studio. Great, great one grammar. Great one grammar. Yeah, <laughs> on a spelling test. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the word continuation and continuity. <laughs> continuity. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so one of you guys um, will uh, can come to the studio here that we record the podcast, spend a couple of hours, we'll do a portfolio review, we'll do a kind of little business overview. Um, yeah. Basically, any questions you want to ask uh, Neil and I about wedding photography or street photography or Fujifilm or anything else, you'll get a couple of hours with us. And we thought it'd be really interesting for you to then be involved in the recording of yeah. that day's podcast. Yeah. Um, don't be nervous. Co. Yeah. Don't, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous like me. Um, co. Co presenting. Presenter. Yeah. yeah presenting. Um, yeah. So we thought we'd throw that out there if you're interested. So, of course. Yeah. Coming for, for you, you'll get uh, Day's mentoring. You'll come and be a part of the podcast. Ask any questions you like. And then I will take you to Costa. Yes. Or we yeah. will take you to Costa. Yeah. And you have a five pound budget. Yeah. Well, well actually, I've, I've got a, um, a Costa uh, loyalty card. Right. So okay. yeah, I'll, pay for, I'll pay for the Costa. You pay for the Costa. Yeah. But to be able to do that, you need to answer this question. And the question is which year and event was the original FinePix X100 launched? So which year and at which event was the original FinePix X100 launched? Send your answers in by email only. No other way, please. And um, because I, I know there are various social media ways of doing so, but we just want your emails and then uh, we will contact the winner and obviously announce it as well. So there we go. Right. Let's go for weddings. Um, we said it's weddings week. An extraordinary amount of time we were able to talk about other stuff before we get to the main uh, the, 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 the main crux of the matter. But uh, yeah, this week's about, about weddings. And we've kind of um, split it into three ways. How you pitch, how you shoot, and what you deliver. Um, so uh, we'll start with with pitching. In terms of of, um, of pitching, shall I shall I launch in? Uh-huh. Then you can right. So Go pitching. It. In terms of pitching, I'm not talking about the marketing of it now. Um, I like I like I'm I'm different to you in this respect. I like people to come to this office uh-huh. here. Now it's quite a nice office, really, in terms of Great. of of its difference because you come in here and you think, well, what is this? Is this a radio studio mm-hmm. or? A, mm-hmm. So I put some wedding pictures on the wall. Um, and I pitch with one one pitch book. It's a pitch book that has 30, 40 pictures in it. Do you know I've never counted? Uh, it's roughly that many because the pitch book changes every now and then. And it's one picture per page. I turn the pages and I tell the stories of these weddings um, in order to obviously have the bride and pr- prospective bride and groom thinking, oh, my God, this is going to be me. So these are different images from different weddings, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that some people will say, no, you have to pitch by showing them death by wedding book, you know, essentially where you show them a load of wedding books. And I never pitch using um, this concept of there's a bronze, silver, gold package, because how special would you feel if somebody said, well, you're the bronze package. Mm. Equally, I don't like the word package. Mm. Um, And I try not to use those words. Package, I think, just reminds me of a a cheap package holiday. Uh, We're not selling packages. Um, we're, we're, you know, selling the idea of having pictures that are going to be your legacy of, of that particular day. So for me, that is one book, big pictures. It's a 16 inch book. So when you open that thing up, it, you know, it's an impressive way to look at a portfolio. And we go one by one through those pictures, talking about the stories, the events, the way that those people felt probably as these images were being made. And I found that to be a very effective way of pitching to a prospective client. You do things differently. <laughs> yeah, I don't really pitch at all. In, in, <laughs> in, in, you know, based on that kind of analogy, I, I very rarely have people come to the studio. They can, of course, and I don't, I don't discourage it as such. But, uh, you know, if I feel that uh, most of my pitching is done via my website and the branding. Yeah, to and be fair, though, that guard dog that you have. When you say you don't discourage it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I do kind of, you know, expect people to use my website as the as the foundation of their choice and as much as i expect people to look at the website and go yeah i really like this kind of stuff i'm going to contact this guy i also expect people to go to the website and think actually this isn't for me so yeah. the website is there to attract as well as you're very display. clear on, on what what you're looking for uh, aren't you yeah absolutely and you're I, very prescri- uh, prescriptive and i and that kind of saves me time because I, and it saves the client's time i don't want people traipsing up the m4 to to my little studio in malmesbury and sitting there and 
and then going right you know we need to talk about group shots and stuff because mm. then we've just wasted everybody's time so you know i just don't i don't entertain into those kind of conversations but you know people do come and when they do come the occasional time they do come then <laughs> it's, it's always funny because the people that do come up to the studio are the ones that have often devoured every part of the website and you know they just want to meet you make sure you exist and then they come up and they sit on the sofa and i go right all right nice to meet you got any questions and then they go no, no not really <laughs> and I'm like right great lovely to meet you see yeah. you at your wedding uh you know and, and and then it is kind of then i just show them some wedding albums and stuff you know but, we but have it, a chat. it's changed a lot for you as well hasn't it in that that uh, most of the weddings you shoot aren't necessarily on your doorstep anymore and i think that's an inevitable change when you work in the industry for uh, a, f- a good few years that, mm. that um, you're not going to be talking to people that are local clients anymore are you no i rarely shoot like within an hour of my house mm. very rarely uh, i can't think of any weddings i've got booked this year that are you know less than an hour away from my home yeah. and that's good for I, I i mean i like working locally mm. um i'm working locally this weekend but but um, equally i really enjoy the variety of of travel mm. yeah you travel more than me but I do travel. I'm not sure I travel more than you for weddings. Well, your yeah, your carbon footprint of shooting weddings yeah. is very different to mine. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you spend time in Italy, in France, in true, Spain, true, Scotland. Yeah. I do quite a few in Scotland yeah. as well. But uh, yeah, I suppose I don't know, whatever. But you know, I I I find that yeah, local stuff doesn't really happen. I spend a lot of time in London and various places. I like that, though. I don't like to be at the same place week after time. So then how you shoot? Yeah, so this is part of the pitch, really, isn't it, in terms of the message you get across to, across to people in terms of your style. Uh, you know, I speak to, as a photographer friend of mine, I speak to regularly on, on Messenger, and, you know, he, he he's kind of... He, he has this documentary approach and his website is documentary, etc., but there's a there's a stumbling block with the types of clients he's... He's, he's getting um, who don't seem to just understand the fact that actually this is the way that he he tries to work. No, that's not their fault. They you know they they don't they know what they want. The clients know what they want, but there's some kind of communication breakdown and there's some kind of style in you know when I look at some of the pictures on the website and stuff, it's there's a few more of the semi pose type images and that's where the confusion comes. So for me, shooting wise, you know I I I show on my website what I shoot and how I shoot, you know and I think that uh, people these days search for us, find us in many more places. And so I know that when people search my name on Google, my YouTube channel comes up. And there's stuff on my YouTube channel, which is footage of me photographing at weddings and, you know, mm. street photography and everything. So they see it. They see the small cameras. They see the, the intimate way of shooting. Um, and that's important. That's part of my message to them. I will I will blend in as much as possible. So, yeah, very small. Very. The, the, there was an accompanying question on this one, actually, from John Miller. Hello, gents. Greatly enjoyed the first uh, a few podcasts. Um, my question to you, um, advantages and disadvantages in shooting in JPEG or RAW? Um, I understand RAW files are larger files, but why would you choose one o- over the other? And I'll throw this in because we're talking about how you shoot, and how you shoot is a technical thing as well. Uh, okay, so yeah, RAW files are bigger. Basically, think of RAW files as the, the old negatives that you used to get in the film day. Um, the JPEGs are your processed pictures that are processed by the camera. They will be smaller. They're quicker to use. They're quicker to download. They, you know, they they often need less work doing to them afterwards. Although sometimes you will still edit your JPEGs. Um, they, you have a greater latitude of recovery and fixing things with RAW files for sure. In the old days, when we only had one memory card slot, I used to just shoot JPEG pretty much all the time. Um, now I actually now we have the latitude of dual card slots in almost all the cameras. I'll shoot JPEG plus RAW. My RAW files will go to a large 256 gig. Actually, I've got a 512 gigabyte card now, which is uh, all my RAW files will go to. It. And and the 512 gigabyte card one will probably get every wedding that I've done in one season on that one memory card. So my plan is not to take that memory card out unless I need the raw files. Right. Um, you know, and sometimes I will edit from the raw files and make the decision when I start the edit whether I'm going to go from the JPEGs or from the raw files. Depends on how tricky the light and the, the situation was. Um, but yeah, so J- JPEG plus raw is, is perfectly valid. There is no right reason. There is no raw is better than JPEG. JPEG is better than raw. They both have pros. They both have cons. Um, then it feeds into workflow and we're going to do a workflow 
by week. Very, very soon. We will, indeed. Yeah. So we will cover things like that. We will cover things like editing, style, um, asset management, backup storage, all of that stuff. It'll be a well, useful one. While we're talking about how you shoot, I thought this was a good question to feed into as well from Randy Tarr. Um, photography is as much as anything about discovering yourself, your identity, your point of view. If you do not know yourself, then how can uh, anyone identify w- with what's in your photographs? Um, we all need some uh, guidance to help discover our photographic identity. Um, how have you found yours? Now, th- I think this does, I mean, we're may- maybe shoehorning this into wedding week, but I think it is important, uh, an identity when you're shooting, particularly weddings. Mm-hmm. Um, although it might be the same answer, really, in, in, in terms of photojournalism. You know, I, I know myself, I, I particularly, I'm, I'm inspired by the work of photographers, conflict photographers, funny enough, and, 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 um, and, and there's not much conflict. Well, there's not usually much conflict at weddings, although I've got a story coming up. <laughs> um, but, but generally, I'm inspired by those, those authentic storytelling images. Um, that, that's what's formed my identity. I don't necessarily show pretty pictures of people doing pretty things all the time. I'm just as interested when I find Uncle, Uncle Bob um, picking his nose on the front row in the church because mm-hmm. it's, it's part of the story. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that, you know, you for weddings, at least um, in terms of identifying your style, you have to you have to basically shoot in a way that you enjoy. If you don't enjoy it, you will stop doing it. You'll be discovered. You know, um, wedding wedding photography is a vocation, right? You know, I I often say this, actually, and and nobody leaves school thinking, I want to be a wedding photographer. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen, right? You know, you you might leave school wanting to be a rock star photographer or whatever, fashion photographer. You never leave school wanting to be a wedding photographer. So by virtue of giving up your Saturdays to be a wedding photographer means you, you're doing it because you must either enjoy it or you know you've fallen into it because somebody gave you a camera and mm. you know you were the uncle with the camera and, and it's gone from there so there's absolutely no point doing it in a way that you don't enjoy and if you do it in a way you you don't enjoy then you'll stop doing it very soon um, so the style absolutely you know you, you the black and white conflict stuff uh, you know I often think about the end product of what I'm trying to shoot before I'll start shooting it. So if if on the day, and I know we're going to come to the delivery in a second, but if, if on the day it's a really beautiful sunny day and there it's a, a barn wedding and inside the barn is dark, I will pretty much already know that the delivery will be colour stuff outside um, bar- barn stuff, uh, black, black and, and white, white inside, yeah, album, yeah, yeah, and yeah, I'll be yeah. visualising the album layout based on that. Uh, and you, you, you were the one that, that kind of educated me to this idea of islands of colour. Yeah. Um, and I think about that when I'm shooting before I'm editing. Yeah, no, I, I think the islands of colour thing for me came from uh, producing my photo films, mm. knowing that it would be a dog's dinner of design if we went colour, black and white, black and white, yep. black and white, colour, 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 black and white, colour. And it just and but the whole thing then paid really into my the way that I approach producing albums. I loathe looking at an album where there's. I'm sorry if you do this, Kev. I'm sure you don't. Um, where you've got um, let's say you've you, let's say you've got a page where you've got nine on one side, nine pictures on one side. And four on the other. Mm. And then, you know, on the right-hand side, within this nine, there's like two pictures that are colour and everything else is black and white. To me, there's no continuity. No, 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 no. There's no cohesive design to the whole process. No, absolutely. The spread is black and white or it's colour. Yeah. It's it's, um, And and don't then go and spread in, um, uh, mix in your your very uh, illuminated, bright outside in the Mm. sunshine colour and very, very dark in a corner colour. You know, it's got to be cohesive. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, that whole idea of of colour is very very true um, slightly kind of comes away from that idea of the style and finding your style and defining your style but yeah I mean yeah, weddings is a is a peculiar beast mm, it is and then, uh, also Randy mentioned here Randy Tarr the question questionnaire question questioner um, said what continues to guide you guys I'm continually guided um, by um, by looking at other people's work I'm fascinated by other people's work uh, but equally, I'm very lucky now that now that I've started doing my other podcast, the Breathe Pictures podcast, actually talking to photographers mm. that I admire. Mm. Uh, that helps me. Now, not everybody can start up their own photographic podcast, but talking to other photographers, you'd be amazed at the amount of photographers that would be delighted to to answer questions mm. and, and hear from you. And the fact that you've taken some interest in them. I yeah. think you'd be amazed. Photographers generally, I've found to be quite, quite a, an open, charitable lot. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you know they, it's it's a great industry. Mostly people are good, and mm. uh, I think there's a very much a uh, from a wedding photographer's point of view, you get people. A lot of people in the wedding photography industry are very. Uh, insulated in that industry they don't really see much more out of it they don't they don't think or they don't know how to reach out and discover other work outside mm. of weddings because they think that that's all it's about um and of course not everybody but actually once you do do that once you start reaching beyond the boundaries of just weddings you'll see so much stuff um meet so many people understand that photography is a real uh, it's a lifeblood for so many other people. It's not just a way of paying the bills by shooting mm. 25 weddings as cheap as you possibly can. Mm. Absolutely. Third thing in the, um, the the trilogy, if you like, here, what you deliver. So um, I, th- I think, uh, are we talking physically deliver? Yeah, I guess so. I would. St- I, I thought that when we were talking yeah. about so it. Phys- yeah, so physically deliver for me, that's either an album, um, a photo film, they will always be the digital images. Mm-hmm. I know a few years ago there, there was a, oh, you can't give your digital images away. I'm afraid it's just a fact of life. If you work in what I work in, which is, I, I think, the middle ground of weddings, mm. if I didn't give um, a USB with all the beautifully retouched images on it, I probably wouldn't shoot many weddings. No. It's, it's expected. It didn't used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, it just is now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that goes out with it. Uh, but I, I I like to deliver an opportunity for people to buy online as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. I still make print sales, mm-hmm. admittedly not as many as I used to, but I still make them. And um, in terms of albums, yeah, I love to deliver albums. I think albums are really really important, um, and also the photo film for me, which is that that um, uh, that slideshow on steroids, mm-hmm. if you like. Mm-hmm. It's it's the 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 the, the, the slideshow made, made. I use Premiere to make it with the sounds of the day as well. So that'll be bits of the speeches. Um, some of the sometimes it's is a conversation that bridesmaids are having in the morning yeah. when they're all excitedly having a chat. And I might stand in. Who's a, in this a, fella here with this camera? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's, <laughs> sometimes I've I've put down a recorder and I've left it for ten minutes before mm. I ask a question, and that question can be something like. Oh, are you feeling nervous? And then, poof, you'd be amazed. Oh. Now, you might say it's a negative way of getting a reaction. GDPR police will be on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the brides and grooms who are generally employing me to do that kind of product know that sooner or later I'm going to record something yeah, that, 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 that's got something. No, oh, I've listened to your photo films. Like They're amazing. Amazing. So that's how I deliver. You, you. Uh, yeah, similar. But um, like, I will deliver the digital images. Totally agree. It's unconceivable really not to um i think uh however i don't give a usb any longer i still have your downloads aren't you i'm downloads only yeah i still have a stack of i still have a stack of dv branded dvds uh you know every now and again i'll use them to throw at the dog or something but that's about as much use as they they get um and i still have a stack of branded usbs also um, but I don't do it. I just use. Um, I've, I've got the USBs. I only give tiny ones away. These look yeah. tiny USBs. Yeah, you're yeah, right yeah. though. The I don't. I don't. The whole thought of going to the post office with a little box and yeah. you know uh, that. Uh, if I, I threw to... this at your dog though, it wouldn't they? Wouldn't it wouldn't wouldn't hurt the dog at all. <laughs> 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 so it's not, I it's um, not weighty enough. Yeah. So totally download. I use Zenfolio for my download delivery. Yep. Um, great little system. Online print sales handled through Zenfolio. The expedite, ex, expediting of the images prints is done via Zenfolio. Um, I also do albums, and I, I, I like the albums. Like I say last year, I think about fifty percent of them probably had an album of some sort. Yep. Um, and this year, what I'm doing is actually every single client is having print, um, some kind of print ideal nice. with them regardless do you print yourself no so what i'm doing is i'll use digital lab up in newcastle okay. um they do a really nice um kind of print box 10 mm. 10 8 by 6s in a nice print box um so even the clients that aren't getting an album will get that do you think that may talk people in because it's a slightly more tangible thing they might think oh you know this would be good in a book is yeah. that is that a, is that a marketing process it's a marketing but also it's it's kind of true in that you know i really want people to have some kind of print element um so you know the the message i give to people is you know i think prints are important so regardless of what 
package. I know you don't like the word package, but regardless of what package you choose, you will get some prints, you yeah. know, regardless. Um, and not one person since I've been using that wording, that's that type of message in the emails yeah. has come back to me and say, well, how much is it without those 10 prints? Mm. Um, whereas before, you know, when you, you know, you used to do similar things years ago where I would say, you know, a nine by nine album or whatever is included for free, you know, and, and you, you you think you're trying to, to lure them in with a, giving them something for free, but actually then they just say, well, well how much is it without it? Yeah. Without that thing you're giving us for free. And then you, you're suddenly, it backfires on you. you. Backfired massively. Yeah. yeah. So it's all about the language and the, the marketing message you give around that. So, um, it's it. Uh, photographers are becoming involved in the trinkets of photography uh, of weddings, rather. You know what I mean? Like the the, um, the person that does the the flowers now provides the uh, the flower the uh, um, the chair covers, mm-hmm. and the DJ now does the evening photographs. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean that drives me mad because mm-hmm. um, I, s- I have a clause in my contract now that says I'm the only person that can take profession professional take, take pictures. Now, professional so what do the DJ? What do the DJ says? I do the evening pictures. Well, if I'm not there, then that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Just not during the day. Not while I'm no, there. No, well, that makes. I once that had a, a real run in with the DJ, um, and it's the first and only time I've, I've been angry at mm. somebody at a wedding. Mm. Um, and it was quite a high end wedding. They had been going really well. Um, we got to the speeches. The DJ had. It was a. Um, I'm trying to think where it was. It was at. Oh, I can't remember Hampton somewhere. Anyway, big wedding. Um, the DJ and his crew had set up during the day, done it really well, done it you know looked really good. They'd done it without disturbing anybody. The speeches were about to start, and then all of a sudden, this 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 young lad comes from nowhere with two DSLRs. Uh, and initially, I, I I thought he was a friend of the family or something. In which case, you know, I'm like yeah, whatever. And uh, as he and he then he started following me around. And, and shooting over my shoulder. Now, bearing in mind, I was shooting with like I don't know an X Pro One or whatever at the time, and he's shooting over my shoulder with these with the seventy to two hundred going hundred thousand shots. Yeah. And I turned around to him and I said, "Boy, sorry, mate, what are you doing?" He said, "Oh, I'm with a DJ." And I was like, "All oh, right, what does that mean?" Because that was the first time I'd ever experienced that. I'm with the DJ. I was like, "What does what does I'm with the DJ mean?" He said, oh, "I'm the DJ's photographer." And I was like, oh, okay. And, of course, we're right in the middle of the speech. So we were whispering this under the table, like, yeah. you know, we're right in the middle of the speeches. What are you were doing under a table with him? Well, you know, he was, yeah. he was all right. He was a nice bloke. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, I, and so I had to wait until the, the end of the first speech that we were photographing, until the kind of swap of mm-hmm, speeches. Mm-hmm. And I ran up to the DJ, and I was like, mate, the, is it true this guy is, is your photographer? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're, we've been here all day. Did you, you know, mm. we were taking pictures earlier during the, from the back of the ceremony and everything. And I was like, y- you're going to have to stop him. I'm sorry because he's, you know, I'm not so fussed about the pictures, but he is totally destroying the way that I'm trying to work. You know, I sell myself as this discreet photographer mm. and he's over my shoulder mm. with mm. a mm. barrel mm. of mm. Yeah, cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, I'm not, I, no, no, I, you know, I'm going to get the pictures. Uh, so I went up to the, I went straight to the best man at that point. Actually, after the next speech, and I said to the best man, I said, mate, honestly, this this other photographer is ruining everything. Can't continue. Yeah, yeah it's, it's got to stop. Yeah. Um, and then he went and told the DJ to, to he stop stopped it. stopped him, yeah. 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 But that was the only time, you know. Just simple, I think, you know, that's that's manners as well, isn't it? Yeah, and he was a real... I, don't I would never presume to, to go... I mean, I've, I've seen some ropey, heard some ropey DJs. Now, I come from a background of working in radio, so... I've done a few Says gigs. the voice of God. <laughs> I've done a few gigs. <laughs> I've DJed. I've been at clubs. Um, but I would never presume to tell the ropey DJs that what they're playing is wrong. No, and it just seemed really yeah. weird to me, you know, like really weird. And I remember, I'll never forget that moment. It was my first kind of conflict moment at a yeah. wedding Not with, nice. a, with a vendor. Not nice. And in fact, the only one. I never had one. Yeah. Never had a run-in with a videographer or anything. Yeah, yeah. So... Okay, um, so uh, there we are. There's there's, there's the, the, the how, whys and where's and all those things, the, the pitching, the shooting, the delivering. Uh, we did say we'd find a couple of things that have, have happened happened to us, the kind of like um, it shouldn't happen to a to a wedding photographer book kind of, kind yeah. of way. Um, go on, you, 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 you can go first. Is well, a funny thing you've seen, or unfortunate thing you've seen, or bad thing you've seen? Well, definitely weren't funny. <laughs> 
um, although I am laughing. Um, uh, you, I always used to think, people used to say all the time to wedding photographers, oh, you must see some really thing, you know, some weird things happen. And, you know, and actually I, I've kind of bumbled through wedding photography thinking, I don't know, I couldn't necessarily pick one specific thing that is like extreme or, you know, really stands out as, as like weird or wacky or anything, mm. you know, until a woman dropped dead in front of me. <gasps> yeah. And that was something that I will remember quite mm. spectacularly and yeah so this this lady bless her um she was quite old she was like 87 or something like that yeah and uh, the father of the she was the 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 groom's grandmother great grandmother i think in fact and the groom's father had said to me earlier in the day my mother's here or my, my grandmother's here bearing in mind she's the groom's grand great grandmother um she's really you know she's she doesn't like having a picture taken much mm-hmm. you know she's she's perfectly well and everything so of course i'm like well that's a that's a rag to a bull to me taking pictures blah 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 so i get my candid pictures and and you know it was great there was you know wasn't any portraits involved or anything so i got the stuff that i needed to get that yeah. i was happy with yeah. of her being her and then um Shortly after the first dance, they went to do a confetti throw, a uh, bouquet toss, sorry. Yeah. And um, I kind of went past her and she just dropped dead. <laughs> Literally. Did you know she was dead? No. W- well, no. Because well, she, she was alive well, at that point. Well, she wasn't doing anything. And well, then well, she was alive well, she and then she s- weren't alive. Slumped in a chair or? Yeah. So she, no, she just kind of went down into the back, into this chair. Yeah. So. So she looked asleep. Well, yeah, but I, I seen it. I saw it, you know, and, and it's like. Oh my god! And, and now oh, I've, you saw her last breath moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, and, and and that's happened to me three times in my life. What, at a wedding? No, not a wedding, but different places. All oh, right, okay. Yeah, so uh, you, you want to be careful. <laughs> it's, it's, it follows me around. Um, god, I'm yeah, hiding. I've done I've done CPR three times. I'm under the table. Um, didn't work uh, any time no actually. But there you go. That was a separate thing. But yeah, and then and then um, so the groom was Welsh, and my mum. I told my mum this story. Obviously, that was the end of the wedding. Yeah. And my mum rang me up a couple of weeks later, and she goes, um, "Do you remember Ruby who used to live next door to your nana?" I said, "Yeah. She died at a wedding recently as well." No, it wasn't her, was it? Well, so I rang the groom, or I emailed the groom. I said, "You, you know, your grandmother who died, or your great grandmother." Yeah. Was her name Ruby? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I used to I used to take apples off her tree when she was a child. When I was a child, yeah. She used to throw slippers at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So there we go. I can't trump that one. No, but you the, must have something. Well, yeah. I mean, I've seen fights. Have you seen fights at weddings? Mm, no. Okay. Well, I've really. seen I've seen a couple of occasions where the um, one side of the family just weren't. Um, happy with the other side of the family and half of them disappeared just before the speeches <laughs> literally got up walked out half the wedding gone from 90 to 45 40 50 people whatever it was <laughs> but that i've seen uh, gypsy wedding i love gypsy weddings have mm. you shot a gypsy wedding uh, i think i have but no, there, i don't a, think it was really okay like so there's a great there's a, there's a bit, bit of a um I mean, what I don't want it to sound like is every gypsy wedding ends in a fight because there's a cliche no. there that's involved. But it's just not right because actually gypsy weddings are full of people having a great time. Hmm. Fantastic. Huge, colourful events. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. a photojournalist way, more stuff to photograph yeah. than you would ever believe. Yeah, the one I did. You amazing. would ever need. Yeah. 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 But I, I did see, um, I, I saw one side versus the other side. It was like the... Um, it was like a Battle of Waterloo just that came in. And I remember I had an assistant with me at the time, a chap called Adam. And Adam um, uh, started taking photographs. And uh, one side looked at Adam. And I thought, ooh, he's going down. I just disappeared at that point, left Adam to it. Really. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, Adam's a tall, <clears throat> tall bloke. Oh, he yeah, look after he himself. After himself, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, but the one I'm going to talk about is the one that um, I, I shot a wedding um, a, a reasonably local wedding and there was an American bride and a British uh, British groom and uh, she loved everything European um, so um, from from memory they had a German this a Spanish that a, and the, the cake was a croque en bouche French mm-hmm. a French uh, creation of croque en bouche isn't it have you ever seen one it's, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like a cone yeah a cone of profiteroles, um, profiteroles that's yeah. it this yeah. one was um, caramel profiteroles and they fireworks sticking at the top uh, yeah, they they can. This one didn't, but they can do. Uh-huh. Yeah, and and normally it's very fancy, ornate um, lattice work around this whole yeah. conical thing, mm-hmm. um, just to hold the profiteroles in place. Yeah, 
And um, on the top of theirs, though, they had a cake topping of penguins. And I can't remember why they had penguins. I, I, but that doesn't matter. I remember Emma saying to me, though, how do we cut a, um, <laughs> a, a croque en bouche? I said, Emma, I've been to a few French weddings. Leave this with me. I said, what the French like to do is they like to lop the top off everything. They take a sword. They take swords, don't they, usually? You've been to a French wedding. Yeah. So they take a sword. They chop everything with swords, don't they? Tops of champagne bottles. Yeah. Everything. That's got a certain word, hasn't it? When you chop a champagne bottle. It has. Yes, you're right. Let me look it up quickly. I'll keep I'll keep. people entertained. How? What? What's the question? What? What is it called when you chop a cork off... The yeah. bottle, champagne bottle. That's not Sh- champagne. Terrible English. Uh, yeah. Champagne bottle. Well, here we go. There you go. What's it called? Um, Sabrage. 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 It's quite the the force of the blunt side of the blade hitting the lip. You don't do it with a sharp bit. Oh. Um, breaks the glass to separate the collar from the neck of the bottle, and the whole thing goes. Pfft. Yeah, I've seen that a few times. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah. Cool. yeah, very cool. Some of the Toastmasters, you know, the the red jacketed brigade, do it. Yeah, yeah, the ones that like to stand behind the person that's speaking. And, uh, that's a, that really annoys me. That's my cue for black and white. Red Toastmaster jackets that stand behind the main speakers during a speech. Why do they do that? Yeah, but you know they do that because they're meant to be protecting them. Are they? Yes. They're just getting in the that's photograph. The law. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, so 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 um, I said, yeah, you just chop it off, lop it off, and um, she said it's a great idea. Now we didn't have a sword; um, we had just a nice big cake knife. What I failed to think about <laughs> was that the cake topping that she was about to chop off was actually connected by a dowel all the way through the middle of this cake, all the way down to the base where it was screwed in underneath, and all the lattice and everything within the cake was all secured to the top um, of the this um, of the cake topping where she was about to chop it. So when they collided with it, bang! The, and you can see this picture on my website actually, neiljames.com. When when um, when they collide when when she hit it, mm. the whole cake went because the whole thing was connected together. The cake uh, just fell off the table. Oh my god! Boom. They're not cheap those cakes either. And I looked at Simon and Emma, and I just I covered my eyes. I, Oh, I'm so sorry, Emma, Simon. I've never seen this before. And Simon looked me straight in the eyes. He said, don't worry about it. Just tell me you got the shot. (laughs) Fortunately, you got the shot. Good. What do you say when people say to you, um, how many shots have you taken, photographer? Gallons. Yes. (laughs) I use that one, four and a half gallons. Yeah, that's always my answer. Off you, yeah. Hashtag, but you like me. And people look at you and they think, (laughs) that must be some photographic thing. Yeah. Can't yeah. think of any other ones. Have you got any others? No, and they yeah. always ask you in the loo as well, when you're in the loo. Do they? Yeah. Oh, then that. It's just me then, is it? I okay. try not to hang around in the loo with guests. <laughs> that, seems, that seems a bit inappropriate to me, Kev. Yeah. Just very quickly before we close, because that's um, time, gentlemen, please. Um, uh, can we just recount the, um, the, the, the little competition thing that we were it's doing? It's competition time! Okay, so, yes, we were going to uh, invite one of you lucky people yep. to spend a couple of hours or a morning or whatever it is with us here in the studio. We will do some mentoring, some portfolio review, uh, whatever you want, basically. Just spend some time with us. And then we will spend the... We will record the podcast, yep. uh, for which you You'll will be, here be for it. co-presenter. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the question you need to send to the email address the email address is click at fujicast.co.uk and the question was which year and which event did the original Fujifilm Fine Picks no, Fine Picks Fine Picks, fine picks. Well, was it yeah, it's still Fujifilm, Fujifilm. Fujifilm. Yeah, Fujifilm Fine Picks it's Fujifilm oh, Fine Picks X100 it was the only camera that was called Fine Picks launched okay so which year and which event was the original Fine Picks Fujifilm Fine Picks X100 announced. Announced. announced 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 yeah yeah okay so so that's a, be too a day of mentoring and you'll be in on the podcast the recording of it and we'll even take you to coffee with Kev's special um, uh, re- re- what is it reduced off Cut. No, I, I just get a couple of pennies. So back. so lucky. Yeah. Um, David Weston, by the way, as well, who who did email um, to say you don't um, tell us how to get in touch with you. I will now as well say it is click at fujicast.co.uk. Um, I thought we made that very obvious. So yeah. all your questions, please send in to click at fujicast.co.uk. Next week, um, uh, that's phenomenal. Um, 
Uh, it's just 10 minutes really of listening to Jason Florio talking about what it felt like to really go in and photograph 9 11. Mm. That's going to be on this podcast. And uh, so send your questions in in the meantime. And, and do, do we have a topic for next week? We haven't yet, have we? Let's think of one. Let's think of one now. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Um, what, what about workflow? Uh, no, no. Storage? Uh, no. What, what about that? street photography? Street photography. You yes. Well, said it now. It's too late. So thank you very much for listening. Um, payoffs this week. Thomas is going to do mine. My dad's Instagram is Neil James. See his films on YouTube at Neil James Photo. His website is neiljames.com for pictures and one-to-one mentoring. And you can hear his other photography podcast, which is called Breathe Pictures, wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, and don't forget his name is spelled N-E-A-L-E. That's my boy. Rosa, go on, talk about your dad. My dad's Instagram is Kevin Mullins Photography. See his films on YouTube at Documentary Eye. His website is kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk. Or for street workshops, training and everything Fujifilm, go to f16.click. There you go. Good girl. Have a great week. Yeah. See you next week. Take care.